Uh, welcome back to the Locker Room Podcast, podcast number 22. Uh, it's just myself today hosting. Ross is taking a break and I think Kieran is, in, is on a much deserved holiday in the Bahamas, I believe. So, so lucky him. He seems to be getting it very handy these days. Um, on the show today, I'm actually delighted to, to announce that we've got one of the most innovative, uh, well-known coaches in GA circles, Stephen Pulcher. Someone who has coached and managed at many levels, right from underage club and county, right up to senior club and county, with great success, of course, at Carlo. Now, just before we talk to Stevie, just a few words from our sponsors, Ripped. That's R-Y-P-T. Uh, www.ripped.app is a platform that connects coaches with their clients and athletes. It helps you create individualized workout programs and delivers them to an app where your clients and athletes can view their workouts and have support of exercise techniques and videos. They can then record the workouts, training loads, and well-being data so coaches can monitor their progress and optimize performance. Mm -hmm. It's a great tool for S&C coaches involved with teams or working with individual clients and also gyms and online coaches. Uh, we have a special offer uh, to share with our listeners also. So if you go over to the DSS website, you'll see a link to sign up to Ripped and you'll also get a two-month free trial of the platform. All right, so let's get on with the show. Uh, we've got Stephen Percher on the show today. Um, uh, welcome on the show, Stevie. Thanks very much, Joe. Thank you. Uh, Stevie, just uh, as I've alluded to there, it's, it's safe to say that you know your coaching journey has been wide, it's been varied. And I know that myself and yourself kind of go back a long way. I think about 15 years ago, you used to send me, me drills and, and, and so on, you know, when, when that wasn't even a fashionable thing to do for sharing ideas. Um, but just about your coaching journey, could you tell us, you know, how, how did you get here? Uh, yeah, well, I suppose, Joe, I uh, got back to um, Manchester uh, Metropolitan University in 1987. Uh, I arrived as a, as a sort of a, an 18-year-old in, in the campus and, you know, with a wide diverse range of sports at the campus, like, you know, obviously studying PE over there, you got to sample, you know, sports that wouldn't have been you know, culturally your own here, for example, the likes of cricket and hockey and things like that as well. And, you know, it was just interesting. And I joined the soccer club over there and played a bit of soccer. But it was a, there was a cohort of Irish students there that was like, you know, a, a lot of really, really good Gaelic footballers at the time, actually, and uh, who had gone across. So I just decided one day we'll, we'll, we'll try and sort of start a Gaelic team here. So we, we developed our own Gaelic team. Uh, we went to one of the local bars in, in the small town that we were in, El Sager. We were sort of based in the sports campus outside the college. And Euro 96 actually had been on the previous years and Italy had used the sport on the campus as a base for their for their actual preparation for the competition. And the pitches were all in, in absolutely pristine condition. A few rugby pitches, a few soccer pitches. It was more or less just a, a sports campus. So we went to this bar called the Mirror Inn, a wee small sort of hokey bar in the middle of El Sager with, with uh, that the students would never have frequented. And we, we asked Dave, the landlord, actually, would he sponsor a set of jerseys? So. Lo and behold, we sort of said, them, look, we'll play every Sunday. We bring 20 men in here and we drink the pizza on a Sunday evening. For a <laughs> you know? And uh, of course, Dave's eyes lit up and he said, right, OK, I'll put you on sausage and chips or whatever. And it stayed from there. And, and so we, we got a group of lads together. We, I, I coached the team, managed the team. It was secretary, it was treasurer, it was everything. And uh, what I thought, we went there, we got a sponsor. And of course, the, the first set of jerseys we got were a beautiful red and black set. As, as, that had to be the only colours, you know. Uh, with the mere in road across them, but started coaching then at eighteen, you know, and playing at the same time, and you know, it was just a, it was just a, a bug. It was something that I enjoyed. It was a passion. I was studying to be a PE teacher, so you were going to be engrossed in coaching anyway, as it was, you know. But I suppose my playing career took a took a sort of sudden halt in, in about say I was about twenty nine, thirty at the time, and people sort of looked back and said you regret it. And of course, like sometimes you do harbour regret not playing on, but circumstances were different. Though, you know, it was tortured with hamstring injuries and things like that as well. The club wasn't really going well. It was not enjoyable. And the school had just won the All-Ireland in 2007, actually. The school's All-Ireland. And I just had a real thirst and hunger for coaching at the time. And I was nearly getting more enjoyment, Joe, out of coaching, which is probably very unusual because most people say there's no substitute for playing. But I just found that the coaching was giving me much more of a, of a buzz. And, you know, I got involved then with... with uh, with Unraked at the time, which was mm -hmm. Martin Clark and John Clark's club in, in, in Mourne. Uh, they had approached me, and, and listen, I was still very young to take my first senior manager's job. At, 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 I think I was 29, I think, at the time. 
you know, sort of take my, my first senior manager's job at 29 was obviously, you know, a big step. And, and you know, I, I had friends of mine saying, I mean, like, how do you go in and command the changing room? But you, you were doing it every day in school anyway. You know, you're managing people and those are just slightly different when you're managing adults. You, you know, you have to, you have to adapt. But uh, this is supposed to then, Joe, you know, I suppose when you start at 29, 40, 41 now, so 12 years have been in the goal. And for 12 years, I've probably... You know, I've probably done a lot, of, a lot more coaching than most people because most people probably only start coaching in their late thirties. You know, so at, at forty-one, you know, I probably had the experience that a lot of other people wouldn't have because they probably played long into their thirties. You know, but but listen, I, I I look back at it now, Joe, and I wouldn't change anything. It's it's been a brilliant journey, and I've been very fortunate to work with with some brilliant players, meet some brilliant people, create some great friendships and, and memories that that will last a lifetime. You know. Brilliant, Stevie. And, and you were with my own club there, Mayo Bridge, for a while. And then I think you, you were at Ballyholan for, for six years, the, the club just outside Newry, and you brought relative success to Ballyholan as well. Yeah, listen, the bridge the bridge was an interesting one. Francie Poland rang me up one day out of the blue and said, look, he's going to give it one more year. He's going to give it a ring for a year. There's a championship in this team, you know, and, and it was very, very interesting because I was with the Diamond or 21s at the time. So... The bridge team was backboned by five of those under-21s. You know, Ryan Brady, Kevin McClory, Conlon O'Hare, uh, Keith Quinn. Um, you know, and we sort of look back now, Shane McNamee, five of them actually. And those five were near starters in the down-under-21s at the time. So I knew the bridge had a serious potential, serious young people coming through. Joe, you know, and look, we're beating the championship final by Kilku with, by two points. Your fella, actually, Benny, was, was, was probably fouled in the last minute. Jim McClory... Just openly admitted this year for the first ever time that it was Stonewall penalty. But Jim, Jim was over, not that not that I harbour any 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 bitterness about it, but uh, Jim Jim was over uh, Kilku at the time. And to be fair, you know, tactically on the day there was one or two little things Kilku did that Sanford Francie would still look back on now and say, look, we should have come in with the element of surprise. But the reason we didn't, Joe, was because the Bridge were actually the highest scoring team in Division One that year. You know, that averaged about nineteen points a game. In the championship semi-final against against Longstone, it was an absolute mammoth performance. You know, they kicked 4-15, 4-12 from play. And it was nearly one of those ones where you were coming in like a sitting duck. You know, damn you do, damn you don't. Do you change things after going so well? And, and yeah. you know, the, the Kilku had stumbled over the line against Bransford by a point in the semi-final. So it was set up for an ambush. And an ambush it was, you know, we conceded two of the worst goals you could ever imagine and, and, and only lost the game by two points in the end. But I do feel, Joe, and probably at the time, if and I'm not being arrogant here or, 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 or whatever, but I think at the time, if I had hung about the bridge at the time, I know those young lads, I, I would have brought them with me. And I think that they were probably a championship away from, from maybe winning four or five. And that's no exaggeration, you know. But, but unfortunately, the, the bridge took a different direction. And, and, you know, obviously they lost a few players the following year. And, you know, and, and it was Kilku that took off and, and the bridge were left behind. You know, and I, don't, I don't actually think the bridge has been back in the final since, Joe. You know, if I'm getting correct, like so. You know, it was it was probably a, a junction in, in I'm actually teaching with Gavin McClory at the minute, actually Gavin's up with some jokes in a minute, and we were sort of saying it that like it was nearly like a crossroads for both those teams, you know, and Kilku kicked on and the bridge sort of stagnated a wee bit. But but look, there's a lot of good young lads coming through now at the bridge, of course, like and, and it's a it's, it's a new generation that are that are hoping to make their own wee bit of traditional history. But Valley Holland then came along, Joe, and Shane McHolland actually are close with Shane's a good friend of mine. Shane's a great manager, you know, brilliant with people. It's his job and work and first derivatives. He deals with people all the time. So when you're dealing with people and work all the time, you know, you, you know, your personality can be very adaptable. And I found Shane to be very, very, you know, really, really good with players and, and really good at, at, at sort of set his team up from a tactical point of view. And he had great belief in this Bally Holland group, you know, really good belief. But Shane felt it would take 10 years, Joe. It's an interesting one. He felt it would take 10 years, and it's 10 years, probably around 10 years now, of sustained Division One status, of staying in Division One, playing good teams every week, you know, getting a couple of championship games every year before this group of players in Ballyholland and before the club, probably club probably believe that they could compete, you know. And I do feel, Joe, that we changed the complete culture in the club. We changed yeah. the mindset in the club. For six years, we installed a belief. You know, we went from losing against Kilku by 25, 30 points to Kilku not beating us in the league home or away for four years. It got to the stage where, where you know, and Lavery and the boys were getting sent off every time they played Ballyhole just, just out of pure frustration because they just, you know, it, it was just, I don't know what it was, but, you know, we, we were always a tough enough to crack. It was a hard place to come there. And, you know, Friday nights were, were really enjoyable. And listen, you know, we had our best season ever. We got the championship semi final. We're kicking the ball away from the final only with a man sent off and stroke a half time against Castle Allen. And, 
the same year we got the league semi final, finished third in Division One for the first time in club's history. So, you know, we did, and, and look, the underage structure in the club took off as well, Joe, and you had a lot of good people involved in the teams. And a couple of years ago, under Shane and Matty Shields there, they won the minor title and won it in great style, and there's six or seven of those lads now playing for the club. So, listen, the club's in good, in, in good shape, it's, it's, it's healthy, and there's a good age profile there. And, you know, I think that they've probably got rid of that tag of being a yo yo club. Of, Division two, Division one, Joe. I think they're now what I would probably call a top six club in, in, in town. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um. We we'll, we we'll talked about Carlo a little bit later on, uh, Stevie. Obviously, all those experiences at those at those different clubs. Um, and of course, I think you, you had spells with underage teams at county level as well. But we will talk about Carlo later. Just before um, we get into that, um, just about your coaching philosophy. Uh, I know it's a difficult type of word to pin down, but what, what do you believe is your kind of coaching philosophy or what do you believe are the principles of good coaching? I, I say coaching philosophy, right? In my honest opinion, every coach, every coach should have a philosophy, right? And, and what I mean by that, Joe, is not a style of play. A style of play is complete. If people get mixed up, you see, in philosophy and style of play. A philosophy is a set of values, beliefs and principles, Joe, that, that are sort of unique to every individual coach. It's very important to remember that they're unique to every individual coach. So your coaching philosophy may change year on year. You might settle on a philosophy. You know, it, it, it can be adaptable, okay. But look, I, I, probably, I probably jotted a few things down on paper and I presented them at coaching conferences over the last few years about my own philosophy, you know, with regards to coaching. And I suppose one of the very first things in the philosophy I have, Joe, is that, you know, and I've got it written down on paper. I don't have it here in front of me, but I, I know anyway because it's been ingrained in me for a few years. But installing a spirit and a togetherness in a group, for me, is crucially important. You know, that's something that I pride myself on, Joe, whether it's school, whether it's club, whether it's county, I pride myself on installing that spirit in the tennis. And I think that if you're in control of that, you know, you can harness that, you can build that. There's ways in which you can build it, you know, you can set up leadership groups, you can meet players one on one, you know, you can go on bonding weekends, you can do like, different things in training that, you know, that, that, that sort of build those, that spirit and that together, you know, and, and create that respect among the group. Obviously, creating a high level, sort of what I would probably call a uh, high energetic coaching environment where, where players, where, where you're helping players reach their potential. You're helping the players reach their potential, Joe, but you're also letting them have fun and enjoy themselves. And that's something that I really, really, you know, I'm, I'm so, so uh, strongly opinionated about. I just think training and football and everything now is so bloody serious that, you know, players go to football and, and they should go to football, Joe, for a release, for a release and for, for a bit of social interaction and a bit, of, a bit of crack and a bit of fun. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, it depends what level you're coaching at and where your club is and what your aspirations are. But, you know, if, you want, if you're looking to win, obviously you have to take things very seriously, well-planned and well-thought-out sessions. And, you know, when we work, we work. But it has to be an element of fun as well, Joe, you know, and you have to give players that opportunity to reach their potential. And I think the, probably the last point of, of my philosophy is sort of a three-point coach would be um, probably treating everyone equal, Joe. I think that's probably the right words, you know, making sure that everyone is treated equal. You know, there's whether it's coach, whether it's player, you know, the star of the team is the team. And, and that has to be the philosophy within the group. You know, the star of the team is the team. There's, there's no individuals, you know, and I, I think consistency and treating everyone equal is, is so important when it comes to coaching. So probably, Joe, in, in, in a roundabout way, that would be my philosophy in general, you know. Yeah, I think um, honesty as well. I think if there's a player that's, that's not getting on the team as well, w would you directly tell that player the reasons why they're not getting on the team? Or, or there are some coaches that might beat around the bush and not tell the player why he, why he's not getting on the team. Is that something that you would you would say directly to players? Well, I, I, believe it or not, in the last couple of weeks, I've probably had to deal with that more than ever. Like, I'm, I'm currently managing Bryant's for seniors. And, you know, for the first time ever at club level, Joe, 57 players landed down in the first night. Like, I wouldn't even have 57 players at Carlo, you know. And, and you know, was, you're just sort of sitting on 57. How is this manageable? Now, that leveled out to a steady 42 in the end, you know, and, and you had a steady 42 heading into the championship. But, because it was such a unique season, the players probably some of the players probably didn't understand this. We have a top thirteen, so that thirteen can't play reserve football. So for the three senior league games that we had before the championship, the thirteen players that were star Joe had to play in those games to get match time, and then the other lads played in the reserve games on a Saturday. But probably some lads didn't fully understand that you know the only way that these thirteen are going to get football is through the first because they're technically they're legally can't play they legally can't play for the seconds. So that was it. That was it. That was it. A difficult one to try and sell the lads and they're trying to get them to understand that everybody's on a blank canvas. Now I think on Sunday pass when we played Clendoff, I think what happened was 
I, I think players realise, Jesus, you know something, Poacher is right, everybody is going to get a chance. We threw three boys into the championship game that hadn't kicked the ball. I mean, hadn't kicked the ball, started, you know, and we introduced three who hadn't kicked the ball. So lads are going to get their opportunities based on how they're going in training, how they're performing in training. And at the minute, what is great for us, it's so healthy for us, is our in-house games are absolutely top class. They're top class. If a team turns a, a kick out over on the opposition, they're punished with the back of the net, they're punished with a score. Whereas in a training game, maybe, you know, yourself, if teams aren't that really evenly balanced, you make a mistake, you don't get punished. But in this training game, you know, you've got 30 players, you can all play senior football, plus four or five who are sitting on the bench looking to get into training. And players have come to me the other day, last Monday night after the championship, there were six waiting for me in the yard park. I thought I was going to get a hammer at one stage, you know, there was that many in there. But, uh, you know, you have to speak to them, Joe, you have to explain them. I, I'm not into text messages or phone calls. I love to look them in the eye and speak to them. Speak to them face to face and say, look, lads, here's where you're at. You're competing against Joe Coulter. Uh, Benny Coulter, you know, Mickey Watts, whoever it is, you're competing against these fights. Are you, do you think you're at that level right now? You know, and here's what you need to do to get at that level. I think you need to do X, Y, and Z. And you have to be bluntly honest with them, you know. And at the same time, arm around the shoulder, you know, it's nearly that two stars and a wish thing. You know, you give them a couple of points and say, look, see the other night, you were going well, you did this well, you did this well, but this is what I need you to do on Wednesday night, you know. And I think then the players feel valued, Joe, you know, and it's not just, you know, and then we've got leadership groups as well, and we would sort of, you know, we, we have six or seven leaders identified there who are all in charge of six or seven players. And, you know, I can I link in with the leadership group quite regularly and I can speak to them and they can link back to those players as well. You know, and it's good in, it's, it's good in that respect, Joe, because it means that the players, communication is crucial. You know, the coaching communication is the key. And I, I think it's important that we're consistent in our message. Brilliant, Stevie. Um, you, you just mentioned there, uh, you know, that people kind of get mixed up between that term philosophy and, and maybe tactics. But just moving on to kind of tactics um, with, with Gaelic football, um, do you have your tactics or your tactics um, based on the players that you have or do you have a template that your players come into and play to? So for, ex so for example, if you've got players and let's say you don't have as many good forwards as you would like, w would you tend to have more of a defensive structure or a defensive system? Yeah, listen, there's no, there's no doubt about it, Joe. And look, I suppose we go back to, you know, on rates where we would have played, you know, we, we would have played four up. We would have played a two and a two quite regularly. You know, it would have been Marty John. I can even remember the four now. It would have been Marty John, uh, Christopher Killen and Paddy Cole, you know, and we would have had Paddy Gartland maybe on one wing and James Cunningham on the other wing. So we would have had two in, industrious players playing wing forward and we would have had four men playing up front who were all scoring threats who could all play, you know, and... and and posing up a threat to the opposition. And that was the way we played for three years within Rick, you know. And then with Mayo Bridge, you know, we would have played five up, you know, and, and we would have had the forwards, you know, the likes of, of, of Kevin O'Rourke would have been playing at the time, Rony Saxon, your fella, although your fella did play middle of the field that year because we found that that was the year, 2012, Joe, where Donny Gall were in their club and a lot of clubs were filling a lot of bodies back. So it, it was nearly a waste of time playing Benny inside because he was just, he was surrounded by fours and fives, you know. So, we felt we got more out of him when he went in the middle, but we would have we would have had a lot of good young forwards there at the bridge at the time, you know, full of running, full of energy, and we would have played five up, and we were a high scoring team that we won. And post the, the six years of Valley Holden, we probably didn't have the luck trait. You know, you were heavily reliant on Ronnie Murder, and then all of a sudden Tierney and Runch came along, and all of a sudden you had two then, you know, that were a threat. But you know, we had to play to our strengths, you know, and and probably for the six years then you were sort of labelled as being defensive, but. The thing about it is, Joe, with Mayo Bridge, we had the best offensive record in the league. And with Valley Holland, we had the best defensive record in the league. Like, we never conceded more than 11 scores, you know, in one season, which was just phenomenal. With one season, our scoring, our scoring average against was like 9.6, which is just, like, people don't give you the credit and the appreciation. That, that's just ridiculous statistics. Like, you know, and I think out of 21 games, we had 15 clean sheets one season, you know, like, I hear a fella Liam was in goals one year and he said to me, he says, I could have, I could have lay on the ground with a cigar, he says, for most of the game. He says, you know, all I, all I had to do was kick the ball out. But that was the thing. Like, you know, we, we prided ourselves in really good defensive play. And Carlo was something similar. You know, you had Dara Foley, you had Paul Roderick, and I know we'll come to speak with Carlo in a second. But again, you know, you're limited with your scoring threat and therefore you had, a, you had to play to your strengths. But, you know, with Bransford, now, like, you know, we've, we've got forwards, we've good forwards, and on Sunday, you know, our two goals in the championship against enough came from early direct football and through the foot, you know, and listen, down Miners is exactly the same this year, Joe, and involved in the Miners and James, and the players were all encouraged, head up, look forward, we've got a brilliant set of forwards, that super important team that won the under-16 Ulster Championship, some great forwards from there, some great young lads from Lockett Island and, and Gary Duff and the likes of that, and you know, 
you play to your strengths. So, you know, we'll play a different way to the Niners. I don't want to say what way we're going to play, but publicly we're coming in to play for man in a few weeks. But, you know, we, we play with adventure. We try and play with flair, but we also try and play with organization too, Joe. So I think it's important that you see the players you have and that the system should suit, sorry, the system should suit the players in your cure. It shouldn't be that the players have to suit the system. You know, I think that's very, very important to remember that, you know, people used to laugh and I say, look, give me a forward line that Cora Finn and I'll play a different way, you know, and that's, that's the reality of the situation we're faced with, you know. Brilliant, Stevie. Um, just moving on to Coral there, you know, as, as a down man, uh, you know, co- coming from kind of a, a county where there might be a culture of attacking or so-called culture of, of attacking and not maybe worrying about defensive things and so on and so forth, uh, you know, was it, was it kind of, it, was it difficult uh, going to, to Carlo? Because, you know, this was a club that was kind of in division, I think division four when you went down there. And as a down man, how, how did it come about for you to go down to Carlo? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll come to your, your first question in a second. But how it came about was very straightforward. It was a turnip. I was running the, the coaching conference that I've run now for, for just over 10 years, Joe. Um, I run a coach education clinic and school as a fundraiser. Started, started in 2010, actually, and with 57 coaches come through the door. And last year in St. Joseph's Murray, we, we had a record number of 340. It was one of the, I think it was the second largest coach education event in Ireland, like for, for a one-man show, like it wasn't too bad now, but uh, no, it's, it's, it's generally certainly full of pride the way our coach education day has taken off and those were the current restrictions that were in place now with lockdown and the likes of that. I don't know if it's going to go ahead this year, but we're, we're working on, on maybe ways in which we can maybe even accommodate it outside, Joe, you know, for two pitch sessions. But Turnick and Tommy, we're, we're at it every year and, and I landed in through the gates one year, I think it was 2015, I landed through the gates of school in Kilkee, and there was this Carlo registration car in the car park, and I said, like, what lunatic that drove the whole way down from Carlo here, and, is there, and it was here earlier than me, but two boys bounced out of the car and introduced themselves. Tommy's a very energetic character, a great fella, just loves football, like, you know, and, and Tommy obviously was Turlick's right-hand man, and two very, very warmly, you know, personal men, Joe, that were just, you could just sense the oozed football, they were proud football men, they were proud Carlovians, you know, they loved everything with Carlo football. And, you know, Turnick had said to me, look, we'd love to get you down for a session. And I said, look, you see how it goes, drop me an email, drop me a text or whatever, and, and we exchanged numbers, we exchanged details, and, you know, we, we had a bit of a chat, and, you know, to be fair, you know, he asked me to come down there, and so in the, in the bank holiday, that was November 2015, and in the bank holiday of 2016, May the 1st, 2016, uh, myself, the wife, and the kids went down. We spent the weekend in Carlow, Bank Holiday weekend. I took the seniors for a session two weeks before they played Louth. And it was probably a bit of naivety in Leicester football, Joe, from the point of view being that systems and tactics and things like that weren't really ingrained in teams. You know, it was more just go out and play, match up, have a go with the opposition. And needless to say, the game was like, you know, a mental affair. I think it was like 225 to like 315 or something, you know, along those lines. And they were beaten. And then I went down and took a session before the qualifiers again, Wicklow, and they won. And then I took another couple of sessions before they played Calvin, and they were very unlucky that a man set off against Calvin. Brendan Murphy was suspended as well, and you know they didn't they didn't uh, get over the line that day in Breffney Park, but they but they ran Calvin very reasonably close to that day in Breffney Park, and I think it gave them a great bit of hope that Jesus, you know something, if we are a little bit organised and we do play a bit of a system, you know that we we can progress. And look, Turnock asked me then in the winter of 2016, and it's probably probably well documented at that stage. I'd been involved with Iron for about 10 years at every level, and. Uh, myself and your fella and Francie Poland and John Kennedy had sort of been uh, uh, rejected for a job with such uh, the high profile uh, falling out, uh, if you want to call it. But uh, no, well, listen. Can you, uh, can you tell us the story behind that, Stevie? Is yeah, that- listen, look, look, it's, it's water under the bridge now, but look, we, we went for a job and, and on the 21 job and uh, manager's job. I, I, we didn't go for it. I'd been approached, you know, so that was the most frustrating thing that. I'd invested a lot of time in assembling a good management team. And, and when I say a good management team, Joe, like it was top class, like it was probably better than most bloody senior county setups. The management team we had in place with men who had managed in Division One, with men who'd won championships, with men who'd, who were iconic figures in down football. We had we a little bit of everything, you know. And look, we went for, for the meeting at the time. And, and look, it hurt me. It did. You know, there's no point in telling any lies. Like it, it hurt me badly at the time, actually, to be honest with you. And, and look, I'm well over it now, for God's sake. Because at the end of the day, in a strange way, and this is the strange thing. In a strange way, you know, it was probably the best thing ever happened to me because I was probably getting, not steel, I wouldn't say steel, but I was probably getting too familiar with my own county. I was probably getting, you know, probably involved in too much nonsense with people, you know, 
supporters and opposition teams and stuff because you're so familiar. You know, familiarity breeds contempt, you know, and to get out of Down, to get out of Ulster and go away to Leinster, like I, I ended up then experiencing Joe some of the best experiences I ever done a coach. You know, it's a phenomenal journey. And, you know, you, you, I grew as a coach. I networked so much, you know, it propelled my coaching to a different level as well when you're picking your wit against the likes of Jim Galvin and Vicky Hart and Malagia work and you know you're you're coming up against serious, serious teams and even the experiences Joe have gone over to your sales in London. Like I've never been to Roosevelt in my life, you know, and look back and say that you rode there a couple of times, you've played, you've experienced London GA, you know, you've seen the community, the atmosphere over there. Like it's class, you know, it, it's great they're great memories to look back on, Joe. So and I wouldn't have got the experience those in an under twenty one setup, you know, because your season would have been short, it would have been played the depths of winter, but we had like so we had some Super summer days, Joe. Like when I think back to the throne game where the weather's shining, Dr. Cullen Park is bursting at the reams, you know, and there's there's ten thousand people packed into Cullen Park for the first time in in, in, in in twenty years, you know. So listen, it was it was it was obviously then in twenty sixteen after that sort of disappointment, you know, that we had, you know, we were sort of asked to come aboard with, with Turlick and you know, we we we, we uh, I went down and met the players then that Halloween and look, the first thing I done Joe was analyze where they were and Turlick had taken them at a very, very low level and he was gradually building, they were building gradually and you could see that they were building gradually, you know, but they'd come, Joe, from conceding 120 points in, in, in or 118 points in seven National League games. Like, that, that's just mental stuff. Like, and you're going to say, how can you win football matches conceding 17, 18 points a game? So, first thing we had to look at, Joe, was getting a defensive template in place and, you know, it sort of grew from there and, listen, 2017, people talk about 2018 being a brilliant year. 2017, Joe, was a class year. Like, Barlow missed out in promotion by a single score difference, I think, or point difference or something like that, uh, to Wexford. They were, they were probably the second best team in the division that year. You know, Westmead got promoted. They were probably a little bit ahead of everybody. But, you know, Barlow easily were the best, second best team. That was the year London actually beat us at home. It was a very low ebb for the group. The change was toxic after Joe. That was only my second game. And I was thinking, what have I let myself in for? But the following week, we had a break in the National League, Joe. And interestingly, we got on a bus with 21 players, 19 of them fit, 19 players in an inter county team. And we went down across with Lane and we played our man a challenge game. Now, I didn't tell the boys this at the time, but I said to the boys, they're fucking fully loaded. They have everybody out today. And the players are looking at me. I said, I'm telling you, that's a full arm attack. Now, it wasn't. There was maybe only the four or five first team players playing, but the Carlo lads weren't really aware of that. I said, that's their full team. We beat them by a point, Joe. And it was an unbelievable game. And we unearthed a character that day by the name of Sean Murphy. We pulled him out of obscurity. We played in the middle of the field and he was a revelation. I had Norma boys coming over here and talk at the end of the game saying, who is on beast? He was just an animal and he tore them apart. And that, he went on a run then, Joe. He won four of our last five National League games. You know, and just missed out on promotion. And then we bounced into the championship. We blew Wexford off the field. You know, we got five championship games that year. We went to ourselves. We played Dublin then. Real creditable performance, you know, was, was really probably put us, you know, in, in, a great, in a great level of, of belief from where the lads are at, you know, and then we played London, we beat London, we beat Leitrim, and we should have beat Monaghan, you know, and we got two games live in Sky, and those were great days, Joe, you know, 2017 was a great platform to build from, uh, there, there's, there's no question about it, you know, and, and I suppose you come back to me about the down thing, you sort of said about the down and the mentality, like, they beat Wexford in, in the Leinster Championship in 2017, first Leinster win in seven years, Joe, there was a pitching base, now, I'm, I'm coming from down where you're beating for Monaghan in the first round, or you're beating Monaghan, and, and you just go home, dust yourself off, look forward to the next round. This was just a celebration that I had never seen before. And it was only then where really Penny really dropped me, Joe, and I thought, there's something happening here. You know, we could be building something here. There's something special because they were just, people were just starved of success down there, Joe. They wanted something to grasp. They wanted a team to follow, you know. And it was very, very interesting when you come from, as you say, our mentality where we're proud football and county. We've got rich tradition, rich history. And, you know, there's a level of expectation in Down, which, which I feel, Joe, sometimes is unfair on the Down managements and the Down players because, you know, we're probably not where we were in the 90s and the 60s. And we've got to understand that. You know, it's a bit like Man United now and Liverpool in the 90s. You know, you're, you're always looking back at past glories and we're down, we should be there. But with no divine right to be there. You know, your structures have to be in place. You know, you have to be well organised. But I do feel in Down club football at the present moment time, there is a really good group of footballers there. And I'm not just saying this, like, you know, I do feel that we could probably, we probably could play a bit more expensive, you know, at, at senior level because there is really good footballers in the county and there's no question about that. And I see what's coming through at underage level through my, 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 my involvement with the minors and the involvement with school and things like that. And, you know, we have a great group of young footballers coming through and hopefully in the next few years, you know, we can see ourselves back at the, at the, at the top table, hopefully, you know. 
Um, Stevie, Stevie, you just mentioned uh, Sean Murphy there. I know in that Dublin game, Sean Murphy was excellent. Uh, he's like a steam train. I think he, he actually got man in a match that day. Yeah. But on that, um, that Dublin game, I know there were maybe rumours going about, did you in- intentionally concede your own, your own long kick out to Dublin and then set up defensively? So you could yeah, just... Well, there, was, there was a little bit of that joke. That's something unusual. You know, people might find that unusual to concede long kickouts. Yeah, there was, there was a little bit of that joke, right? There was a little bit of that. But what it was, was it was a safety net. So what we had was, we were trying to expose... We knew Dublin would press, right? We knew that. We knew like they would have, they would have no respect for Carlos. So they're thinking, look, we're going to go full press. So we were thinking, right, draw them in. And if we can go over the top, we can get Sean Murphy coming off the shoulder, Sean Gannon you know, care more when we get some decent runners coming off the shoulder pace. So what we were, Joe, and this is true, when you look back in the game, in the first half in particular, we were half a yard or just a little small break away from opening Dublin up. We really were. There was a couple of times Cooper dived on a ball from a kick out or a break ball, you know, got his hands to it just at a time when Gannon was coming off the shoulder or Sean was coming off the shoulder. So what we were trying to do, excuse me, Joe, we were trying to isolate Brandon Murphy and trying to go long take the brakes off him and break off his shoulder. And we left Paul up inside on his own. And, and it worked like this. In other games, Joe, against lesser teams, we must have scored six or seven goals off that kick out. But the flip side of it is, and this is the thing, we were sort of safe as well because what we had was we drew our half forwards in, we tucked our half backs in, Dublin went full press. So even when the ball broke down, we still had 20 men inside our 45, 10 Carlo, 10 Dublin, Joe. So there was no space for them. But a lot of teams, they make the mistake against Dublin of, you know, of pushing out in the kickouts, looking to draw in. But what you're leaving yourself then is you're leaving loads of space in your scoring zone, you know. So we knew if they did that and we lost our kickout, we'd be cruelly exposed. So what we had was we had a template where we nearly had a safety net, Joe, of safety numbers, you know. And it was, it was an interesting play. We didn't tactically go out to concede them, but what we did have was if we did concede them, we were still safe. And that was a key thing. And listen, you know, in that first half, Joe, a big part of our game was game management. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an aspect of, of the game that is not the teams don't focus on against Dublin. Tyrone have started to do it this year without playing golf with Niall Morgan there a few weeks ago. And um, Stephen Broderick one day went out for a game of golf and Morgan was sort of saying to me, he says like, you know, their game management against Dublin has, has now improved. When they went in in 2018, they were still probably naive. You know, they were playing the game at 100 men an hour. They were 5-1 up. He says, when we were 5-1 up, Stevie, we should have just sat on the ball, rest on the ball, made Dublin come out. But he says, we kept going at Dublin, going at Dublin. And then they get the momentum swing and, and then it can just blow you away, Joe, in five minutes. So a key aspect of our game management, you might laugh at this, I was actually working with the goalkeepers that week on how they could chill a minute on kickouts, you know, getting them to walk behind the goal. And we were timing it, you know, we had it started in 37 seconds, then we got it up to 57 and ice is class. We're nearly in a minute. So uh, <laughs> you can see the referee come and say to uh, yeah, Greg, Johnny, come on, hurry up, you know. But all them things do matter because it just breaks their momentum. It breaks their, their you know, they want, Dublin want the game to be high octane, they want it to be high energy, they want it end to end because they've got such athleticism and such, such you know, really, really good conditioning, better than any team. So that's why they want the game played at that pace. But if you just bring the game down, and Joe, that day we had 58% possession in the first half. That was, that was the statistics. 58% possession and one score in the game. And when I look back at the game, Sean Hurston gave them seriously, a seriously high volume of soft free kicks in the second half. You couldn't be like, when you watch Pag, watch the Pag's and you're just go, oh my God. It was mental, like, and that's not me coming in, you, you know, with a, with a Carlo hat on, bias. It was, it was absolutely horrific, the amount of soft free kicks they got, you know. But listen, Sean, go back to Sean Murphy. Sean's a great character, uh, lovely fellow. Unfortunately, I don't know if he's even going to play this year because the, the rumour is that he, he's joining his hurling, you know, and, and, if, and if the hurlers get a hold of him, you know, he's going to be some loss to the football. Is, is, uh, <laughs> is Broderick playing this year? I heard he's, he's had a spleen injury or something. Yeah, yeah, he's been around a number of years ago. I think it's well documented now, you know, and I think he, he, he's, he's sort of shielding at the minute, you know. Um, he, he's not shielding from golf anyway. I'm taking money off him every time I play him, you know. So, uh, but no, he was down last Monday night. We, we played Royal County down. He, he, he fell in love with the course there last Monday night. But listen, Paul's a great lad, but at the same time, you know, he's his own, he's his own reasons at the minute for not sort of playing and things like that. And, you know, I don't think Brendan either could be about next year either, which is a big loss. So, It'll be a difficult job for Niall, you know, um, next year, you know, and I suppose Niall obviously would have managed Palatine as well, Joe. And and Carlo clubs are very, very, they're very parochial, you know, and I know Eerog, like Eerog are a big club and they're a great club, but they would have, their players would come in, Joe, with a, well, careful to say, but they would come in maybe with, with a, 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 
a high opinion of themselves, a high opinion of themselves, you know, and nearly value the club maybe more so than, than the county of time. So, you know, his biggest challenge now with Carlo will be to try and to knit that all together again, you know, and the fact that there's probably no Carlo men involved, you know, might be difficult. It might be difficult because uh, Tennis was very, very good at that job. Very good at that, you know. He, I think he's got um, Joe Brennan in there, the ex ex Dublin footballer and GAR contributor. I think he, he was he was on the GAR there, and I think he was asked, um, "Are you going to change much when you come in?" And I think he said, uh, we're, "We're not really going to change much. In fact, we might actually contact you know you, yourself or Turlock about keeping that kind of template just for this season." They, they haven't been in contact with you asking about the players or anything. No, because they're not Carlo Menace. If, if they do contact me, Joe, I'll be telling them I've enough of them to worry about. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, have enough, I have enough to worry about, but uh, no, yeah, no I, I have enough to worry about, as I said, worry about their trouble. Trouble is not, but listen, it's going to be difficult for the two boys. There's no question about it because there's not an awful lot coming through, uh, uh, Joe. And the players did come to me when Turnick stepped down. You know, the players came to me on mass. And asked me whether to go back as manager, you know, and and look, I, I did give it a bit of thought. I, I, there's no point telling any lies. I did give it a bit of thought. Um, you know, the county board contacted me, asked me whether to be interested in things like that as well. But look, you know something, Joe, I'm going to be totally honest here now. Deep down, my heart just wasn't in it. You know, I'm backing down now. I'm involved with the miners. I'm back working in Newry and St. Joseph's. You know, I'm, I'm very content. I've lost that travel. You know, I'm I'm, I'm getting my handicap uh, cut and dull here every other week. So. I'm just, I'm just enjoying the time that I have back, you know, and I think it, it's, it, it's uh, listen, good luck to them anyway, and, and look, I'll always be looking out for the results. I've, I have a huge amount of time and respect for, for, for Carlo and their people as well, Joe, because it created some brilliant memories, you know. Okay. Um, Stevie, uh, we, 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 um, you've been through your time. Just uh, your relationship with Turlock there. You, we, we had Turlock on the, uh, on the show there a few weeks ago, and he said that, you know, you, you were the final piece in the jigsaw of getting that kind of success at Carlo, did you did you realise you were the final piece in the jigsaw? No, oh, well, listen. Look, I suppose at the time, so I I have, a, I have a very adaptable and unique personality. You know that I can sort of I can I can mix and have a crack with most. You know, and and I suppose it stands back from the days of college. Like I remember going to Manchester, and I didn't I didn't touch a drop of alcohol until I was twenty. So mates of mine had to have a few drinks in the top. You're making up for that now, Stevie. Well, I'm making up. For, I tell you, what, more than making up for it. You know. Yeah, go, that that takeaway in Gormans and Mayberry was great during lockdown. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, time would have had to do though the pints were flat. But yeah, no, but hey, listen, you know, I suppose going back then, Joe, you know, I suppose I would have used my personality quite a bit, and I would have been very outgoing and very chatty and very talkative. But I think you know, going back to to sort of teaching as well, like you know, when you're teaching Joe as well, you know, you understand how to communicate with people. You know, communication is crucial, and you know, I. I was building bonds and relationships there, and I'm very much a players' man. I'm not, I'm not a standoffish manager. I'm not a standoffish coach. I like to get the, I like to get the know of my players as people because I think that when they know you care, then you know they'll play for you and they understand. Then you know I think that that's very important. I remember the great John Morrison, Lord rest him, telling me, he says, "Stevie, players will not, players don't care, you know what you know until they know that you care, you know." And I think that I've always taken that mantle with me, Joe. You know that the players. While I'm here, I give you everything. I give you everything I have, you know. And you know, again, you're trying to build character in them. You know, you're trying to install a bit of spirit in them and a bit of togetherness. And you know, I think that's crucially important. And that's something that that, that I would have prided myself on, Joe. You know, and I suppose for Turlock it's probably difficult because he's coming in from ear oak and he's always been beaten with that ear oak stick. You know, some players just for toxic, like you know, Rathilly and ear oak would be big rivals, and you know, Brendan Murphy was Rathilly, but like Brendan wouldn't have realised how much Turlock thought of him until I told Brendan, you know, and I said, Brendan, you don't realise how much that man thinks of you, how much he rates you, you know, because Turlock was, like, he just, he loved Carlo, he loved all the players, Joe, it didn't matter where they were from, what club they were from, you know, and we created that club spirit in a county setup, which I feel, Joe, was probably one of your biggest challenges at the county level. One of your biggest challenges at the county level is trying to create that club spirit, because you know Derry, like, what has gone wrong in Derry? Like, when you think of the footballers at Derry football, Alf, and people say, oh, it's the club rivalry, you know, and you're going, well, it can't be that much because Tyrone, for example, have they cut the lump out of each other in the Tyrone Championship, but yet they've come together at senior level and they tend to, you know, you know, it becomes then a very, very much a, a tight panel. So, you know, it, it, that's a big challenge at county level, you know, trying to create that spirit and that togetherness. And I suppose that that, that that helped, Joe, me coming in from the outside, but it also probably helped with, you know, the personality that I have too, you know, and, and it, it probably worked out that I was staying down there quite a bit, you know, and Seth and Marie would come down for the odd game and, she would stay for the weekend and the kids would stay. So your family was part of it. 
you felt part of it, you know, and when you when you have that and you, you spend time and you're engrossed in it, like I was landing down Joe most days, for example, at five o'clock. So I left school at three. I could be in Carlo for about five, quarter past five. I would maybe go for a walk in the hurling club some days or I would meet, catch up with a few people or have a coffee with someone or, you know, call into somebody's house and have a chat and a bit of food. And, you know, when you, when you were, there's no other coach would have spent that time doing that, you know, and I suppose that sort of helped me too, Joe, to build those links and, and, and that personal sort of touch and getting to know people, you know. And listen, it's, it's look, there's no question about it. When you look back now, you probably think, yeah, it was, the two of us worked really well together. Turn it just let me get on with things. Let me do the coaching, you know, and it was it was a nice combination, you know. Okay, just just uh, up, Stevie. Um, can you hear me properly? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. You you um. I think you've got down minor training there. Uh, I think you're in. You're with the down minors now at the minute. Just looking at the future. Um, you're in with wee James there at the minute, are you? Yeah. Yeah. In with James. Yeah. In with James. Oh, there, there's a lot of good players coming through down with down. <laughs> We have, we have some we have some great players, Joe. Some great players. Uh, you know, there's there's some great young lads coming through. The, the future the future is certainly bright. You know, um, listen, we, we, we haven't obviously seen them since March, but a uh, funny I was talking to a man the other night about it. We said like, you know, we played Cork in a challenge game uh, about a week before lockdown up in Abbottstown, and we played them off the park for long periods of the game. The game ended in a draw. Uh, we conceded a couple of late goals, and the game ended in a draw. But Cork would be one of the favourites, you know, obviously to win the All Ireland, and it, it showed. Our lads, it give our lads a bit of belief that we can contest and we can compete with some of the best teams out there. And the following week, we played in the Ulster League against Derry, and we blew Derry off the pitch by 13 points. And it's so disappointing because we, excuse me, we were just starting to build at that stage, and things were going really well. And but I laugh and joke anyway. So I said, no matter what happens, we we were the champions of the Ulster League because we won our first game by 13 points, so nobody can take that off us, you know. <laughs> we're claiming we're claiming an Ulster minor league. <laughs> But, uh, no, so look, we've got the championship in a, in a month's time, in, in about six weeks' time. We play for Mana uh, in, in Brewster Park. It's going to be a very difficult game. Uh, but we'll get the lads together now. I think the 14th of September, we're allowed to train. So, and we haven't seen them. We had a couple of Zooms during lockdown with them. But, you know, just to, it was more Joe just to be there in a support capacity because some of the young fellas, I think, were struggling mentally uh, with, with the whole thing. And, you know, we just wanted to touch base with them and say, look, we're here if you need us. You want to hook up for a walk or whatever, or you know, you want to come down to Kilbony Park and get the ball about, you know, do so because you were obviously very restricted in what you could have done, you know. But uh, but no, James is a great James is a great fella. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes stand back and listen to him talking to the miners, and I think to myself, like, you just don't even realize the little nuggets and little golden pieces of information you're getting of someone who has been there, done it, seen it all, you know. And and James again is, is very like Turlock, you know, he's he's a He's a players' man. He stands back. He lets his management team get on with it, you know. And and you know, myself, Coley, his Daniel, you know, we're we're all there. We're doing our bit and coaching, you know. And it, and it's enjoyable because it's not just all me, Joe. You know, I I would ring Coley before, and he might take the warm up and a block of training, and I might take a block of training and the warm up, you know. And it's a nice mix. It's a nice blend. And Mark's got his own unique style of coaching as well. You know, he's he's a bit more calmer and placid than me. I'm I'm more of the the madman of the two, but. But it works well. It links in well, and and you know it's 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 working well. So, you know, long may it continue. You know, brilliant, Stevie. <clears throat> I know you have to get on the training there. But uh, are there any upcoming upcoming coaching seminars? I know you used to do a lot of them, but uh, obviously with the close down, are there are there any sign of those getting back again? Yeah. Well, listen. I suppose that what we're doing now, Zoom, seems to be the way forward, though. You know, and I think a lot of people during lockdown realised that you can you can cut back on your contact time. Like with Brentford, for example. You know, I would have done a few Zooms with the players over lockdown and we would have done a wee bit of video analysis and stuff through lock, or through Zoom, you know, which, which cut cut back on collective meetings and, and the likes of that and, you know, take a players out of the house. And I, I think it, it could be the new norm. But but listen, as I said, my own coaching day, Joe, is, is a huge day. It's, you know, it's normally the second weekend in November and at the minute I'm thinking to myself, could we run an outdoor pitch session and just have coaches arrive just for an outdoor session, you know, two outdoor pitch sessions. And, and cut out the indoor session. I think that's maybe probably what we're going to be looking at. But I'll have to speak to uh, Steve McGeehan or whoever's involved at Ulster GA level to see what I'm allowed to do and how many people I'm allowed at it. Because last year, we 340 at it and it was building every year, Joe, you know. So that's the St. Joseph's coaching day coming up. So hopefully, next few weeks, we'll probably start to plan that. And if, and if, if, if we get the green light, you know, we'll probably run a couple of pitch sessions outside for, for coaches to come and observe because there's a great thirst and there's a great hunger. And listen, so at the end of the day, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. And, you know, education empowers people. And one of the key things that I always believe as a coach, you never stop learning. 
you never stop learning, and the day you stop learning is the day you quit. You know, so it's it's uh, it's it's definitely an avenue where, where where there's a great thirst and a great hunger for. Okay, well, thanks thanks for coming on the show, Stevie, and um, you know all the best with Bransford. I think you're playing tomorrow night, is it? Uh, no, we, we're actually we're we the free weekend. We, oh, we're free weekend in the quarterfinal. We won our first two games, so. Uh, we're we're seated in the quarterfinal, so the draws tonight. Kilcoo play Burton tonight, and Kildare play Melbridge. So I'm just hoping that all those four teams just batter each other, ten red cards, fifteen injuries, and then we get one of them in the next round. You know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, brilliant. Uh, thanks, Stevie. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, and just finally, a word to our sponsors. Uh, just thanks to Ripped again, our sponsors, and just head over to the website there uh, for more information. Uh, okay, thanks for listening in to uh, the Locker Room Podcast. And we'll see you next week.